Mijn gedrag uh, betekent ook. Actually, it, 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 this might be like, it might end up being close to movie length, unfortunately, uh, when it's done. Prehistorically, we've uh, been snacks, and uh, our music sets in neighbor neighborhood of time about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. maybe less, mm -hmm. on a good day. And we, we have uh, usually kind of very short, very short things and very short segments of music. And uh, I think with this movie, we also kind of hearkening back to silent films. Uh, we we put on eye makeup to to kind of go in the way of uh, Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin to to mm. use simple things like that. Or we also knew that we wanted to play things back at a slightly higher rate of speed. First of all, you, you're able to get more covered in the amount of time you have if you just kind of play it back faster. And then um, yeah, it's like three hours of rushes for 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like the amount of the, the amount of uh, material generated in actual time being boiled down into um, something that's probably um, I see a small divot in my fingernail, about that big from from here. Seems to be the the proper ratio. But also to use a silent film or the idea of a silent film can tell a story without. Depending depending on language and using uh, using language treatments and treating people's voices in a variety of different ways, but kind of having at the at the core of the sounds be an, an emotional content or some type of or you know a lack of emotion like total total blank speaking and we will chop your hair off and we will give you red suits and we will. Decode your body and reinsert you into a pleasure matrix, and you will tell us what you find there. You know, it's kind of one of the basic short ideas of, of the movie. So, <laughs> competing for the five dollars on the table. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's also an open, there's an open invitation, five dollars to who can guess the plot. Well, that's what I'm trying to do, actually. Okay. Is it the body snatchers preparing uh, for the dollhouse? The body snatchers. Well, body snatchers like uh, sort of, uh, for a dollhouse. Hmm. Uh, not a bad you guess. Write that one down. That's not a bad guess. guess. Yeah. Uh, not not exactly. Not exactly. We we were we're thinking of like maybe reverse Wizard of Oz. That we thought that maybe the outside world would be um, kind of fantastical with the colors. 
flipped. That's also a cheap way to make it look sci-fi. And, um, <laughs> and, and then so the, 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 it's like reverse Oz because the, the actual, once we get into the, once we get into the computer, it's, um, it's like normal, um, normal color. Um, 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 um. We are using the name Gasa to represent the movie. We haven't figured out the specific title, but for us, Gasa is a, t you know, a, a takeoff part of the con on NASA, with, except instead of the uh, National Aeronautical and Space Administration, we are the um, Gastronomical Anatomical Sensory Administration. And the lab, the laboratory that you saw in the film represents a service bureau where people are inserted into a series of pleasurable experiences that will be printed on their memories. And a lot of the real, other parts of the film are, are us in these pleasurable experiences. <coughs> and pleasurable in quotes. Yes. Quote, quote. And we, for example, we have a you know film of uh, I'm on a, a gurney, and there's a woman dressed as a, a fortune teller, and she's looking at me, and then she uh, goes, and a cupcake appears on my body, and she just kind of draws a pattern similar to the uh, you saw the the ten dots earlier, like the the triangle, and we we, we keep referring to that shape and going back to the shape of like. This triangle with ten with ten dots kind of being in a in a unit together, and one of the ideas for, uh, for like kind of the, the language game that we that we've been playing is uh, um, kind of a language that sounds like many different things or like lots of kind of scrambling things at once is derived from the idea of like if there's a language that it requires ten people to speak the language how difficult it would be to get anything done. Because you'd have to move around through the world with your nine friends and ask for things like, I'd like something to eat. You know, is, is this the train to Paris? Things like that. But you have to all speak together in one cohesive way that generates meaning. And that as an idea notwithstanding, we, we somehow came up with the shape of uh, ten dots in, in kind of more or less equal equal relation to one another in the form of a triangle, and through uh, like the animation, we, we thought, well, maybe when a dot changes color, that's like a way to indicate to each speaker of each point in the language that that's this this is your information you need to relate, or this is like a way to instead of use like um, use an alphabet, we have many distinct characters. You have your one your one unit your one unit of character, and then like the nuance of that. We'll, we'll be able to uh, you know, differentiate one from the other, but using it in like a very efficient, simple way. And the idea that this society that we're described, that we're kind of part of in the movie, is like a very, very efficient, like very ordered society. And then, well, but if you want to get messy and dirty and like feel, feel like a big like pork chop slide around on your knee, you, we can we can make that we can make that happen for you. And you come to us, and, and we'll we'll put you into this computer program, and you'll wind up in the situation. And the characters that, that Tom and I play are people who are, um, I think, before this this is like set into use in a in a in a broad way, we're a couple of uh, test mice. Yes, and we were, were collected by uh, by the the hunter and brought to the lab and then shaved and prepared for uh, the experiment. And he gave away the plots, right? Pardon? He gave away the plots on the five hours of you. <laughs> You just you know your questions anyway. I was wondering whether to just put up my hand and yeah, what you just said. That would be yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the sham. That's the con. Okay, well, we can divide the five into how many different people do we have? <laughs> you have a short break. So questions? No, no. Yes. I, I do have a question. Um, I, I was uh, curious about your your process. Um, so it, it it comes off as a very uh, stream of consciousness sort of. Uh, sort of experience, and I was wondering, you know, how structured was your uh, creative process? Um, the shoots are like, um, are pseudo-improvised. Yeah, yeah. The shoots are pseudo-improvised. They, they, they're just kind of like, we sort of know what, what we want to do, but we're not quite sure how to get there. We set up some of the shots ahead of time, but then we just ask people to, to do stuff, and some of the stuff's just funny. You know, we just, like, I'll just be sitting there, and, and like the, you know, we have this scene with all these cupcakes all over Dan, and it just occurred to me that it would be really funny if she was grinding the cupcakes into his face with her feet, 
And so we just filmed that. But that, yeah. you know, it's like, it's not really, you know, it's just, it's just kind of like off the cuff. <laughs> right, right. So, so we're keeping on the network. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Southern California, the Salton Sea, amazing, unlikely, way below sea level, and one of the hottest deserts on Earth. 20 million people live within 90 minutes of it, and most have never heard of it. Back in 1905, a development company came up with an irrigation scheme to turn the desert into a fertile farmland. Unfortunately, due to Mother Nature and questionable engineering, that was what they termed an unplanned change of course. The wild Colorado River reached a bank and for two years flowed downhill in the Salton Sink, washing away almost everything. But it was eventually stopped. By the 1920s, it had become a tourist destination, described as mysteriously enchanting, teeming with adventure. In 1958, the American middle class was at its peak, and another development company had big plans for what they now call the Salton Riviera. Brochures promised a resort bigger than Monte Carlo, Palm Beach, and the Riviera combined. Two electronic brains doing community planning, golf courses, pools, marinas, fresh ocean breezes, super spectacular modern resort living, all for as low as $29.95 a month if you bought now. They came by the bus load, there were traffic jams for miles, the average Joes took it off the blind and sinker, and who could blame them? Things were great and only going to get better. But you know what they say, even about the best laid plans? They often go astray.
sitting there, and we were fascinated by it. Yeah. And, um, we, this is kind of an impromptu soundtrack we made, so, but it kind of gives you a feeling. It's very strange there. And um, that's all. Just visually, it should tell you enough, you know? It should speak for itself. Yeah. <laughs> Does it uh, attract a lot of squatters, or does it attract anybody? Uh, yes, there there are squatters there. There's uh, migrants that on both ends of the sea. There's a lot yeah, of farm. Like in Southern California, so maybe Mexico. Uh, it's very near the Mexican border, but I I imagine the ones that are here, because they're being very rigorous about this now, are legally there. But still, it, it doesn't cost you very much to live there. And there's also older people they can live there for uh, on their social security checks, and that's like eight hundred dollars a month. It doesn't cost you very much to live there. But it's not uh, squatters in the sense that we know here in Europe, where you know fairly decent people live in the squats. It's very scary. They have a normal life. There are really people that they live in those messes that you see in the pictures of rundown houses. They live in those. Uh, he would be photographing, suddenly hear a sound and realize somebody is actually living somewhere in that little mm -hmm. corner. So. Yeah, did you find you were uh, entering spaces a lot, kind of on your own, it seemed like very unprotected, and like, oh, maybe we can take photos here. You know, I was, I was wondering, basically, how much breaking and entering did you guys have to do? None. <laughs> None. I always wait for somebody to, to crack a place open. Right, first. Right. A lot of the places they've been closed for 30 years, so when you come in, it's like all the stuff from 30 years ago or older. Wow, yeah. There's packaging, there's cereal boxes from yeah. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just but, clothing, the photos of family. Just yeah, they, they just leave, yeah, many people have everything behind. Why? Um, it was a variety of reasons. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole other show. Um, uh, on the west side that I was talking about, there was a whole planned community there, and if you look on Google Earth, you can see it. The streets are all there, the sewer lines are there, electricity is there, but nothing got built. And it's just a harsh, harsh desert. It's it's miles from anywhere. Up until recently, though, you couldn't get gas there. When we were out, you couldn't go to the bathroom anywhere. Uh, no fast food. I mean, it's not a place you choose to live. I know it sounds funny, but in California, Three miles from a McDonald's is just, it's unheard of. <laughs> so, you know, you're just kind of stuck in this place. It's like you're on the other side of the world. And they, they have TV there. They understand where they are. I mean, there's so much more to this place than just what we showed you. It's uh, unreal. And then, of course, it, it happens to be 40 plus degrees most of the year there. So you get out and... Well, yeah. it's, it's very hot there. You can grow them year round. That's why people grow crops. Right. What are you What are you trying to show? Uh, we're not trying to make. I don't think it's any kind of social commentary. It's just the textures on. I don't know. Uh, there's many things I'm drawn to there. Uh, I when I photograph these things, I try to make it look. Not beautiful in traditional sense, but I'm not trying to make it look any uglier or anything like that. It's just there's a beauty there to me of uh, textures and things. And in a way, when I go there, it's like going in a time machine, literally, because the paint colors they have there are from many years ago. It doesn't rain a lot, so you don't get a lot of things decaying rapidly there. So things are relatively intact. There's shapes there. It's kind of like stepping back in a weird way, but then things are also destroyed too. It's just. Uh, it's very weird. Mm -hmm. And then also, like Truce was saying, when it's very hot there, when you leave your car, it's like you're leaving a space capsule. You, know, you can only be out for a certain amount of time before you get dehydrated. So, I don't know, the whole experience of it, it's just, it's like another world. And then it's only two and a half, maybe three hours from Los Angeles. And it's just, it's weird, yeah. you know? I just wanted to say that it's great to see somebody playing the old EMS synthesizer. And what I really like is like the melody he plays. Oh. Da, 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 da. 
Yeah. It really gives a feeling of loneliness to me. Yes. 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 It sounds pretty sad. Yeah. Is that yes. what you meant? Yes. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to have something that's it sounds sad, but all, also it could sound like some kind of an anthem or something. Yeah. Totally. Um, very simple, yeah. uh, but also very sad um, because it's it's sad to see. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's sad to see that you know it's just fallen apart. It's fallen to pieces. You know, um, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a decline that shouldn't be there. And um, well, I think it's beautiful, uh, the decline is beautiful to look at, but it really shouldn't be there. Um, it should be a cherished area. I mean, you can see uh, Vasco made all these, uh, he drew all the birds and um, environments around here on the walls. And it's, it's amazing, but it's, it's a major migration for birds to go through there because they cannot go to the California coast anymore because it's been developed, overdeveloped. So now this is the one out of the 600 species of birds, 400, I believe, yes. passed through there, this huge lake. So you see unbelievable <laughs> birds. It's just, they only come there. It, it's just astonishing. Mm -hmm. You just can't believe what you see. And, and it's funny that, <laughs> sorry, I don't need to walk. Sonny Bono, as you might all know from Sonny and Cher, he tried to save that area for a while, and there's actually a, a Sonny Bono bird sanctuary. <laughs> Sonny, he did okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, besides the bird, uh, the bird issue, is, I think it's not so sad. It's like uh, because in the music there was also kind of part where there was some kind of a relief, relief or hope or like uh, beauty or like. Tranquility or something, I don't know how to explain it, but there was some, at least I experienced it, but um, I think that it's, it, it's a God gift, these it's, places. It's what? It's a, it's a gift, these places. Yeah, you mean More that's the way said. it looks right now? Or? Yeah, the, the, whole, the whole thing as you experience it, as you like communicate it to us. Yeah. It's like, it's not said, it's like, no, there's some melancholy in it there, of course. Yeah. I know the experience is a sad, it's not a sad story you're telling, yeah. or you're showing. It's, for me, it's more like a, yeah, it's, it's a very special thing. And you call it weird or whatever, but it's like really inspiring. It is special. Yes. Yeah, I mean, to us it is special, yeah. Makes me happy. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but I, I, think that, I think that decay in a way is a little bit sad, isn't it? No, why? Maybe no? I think it's sad. I think it's beautiful. Maybe not. It's personal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bosco, could you hoist the loft your percussion and jazz oh, and yes. uh, talk about it a little bit? Because um, I'm curious about it. Yeah, this is a, it's called a hand drum, but I mean, I made this out of a Freon container that we found there. And, uh, part of the thing that I'm doing is making sculptures out of uh, found objects that we're finding there, which are getting harder to find because now the, the economy, people are just stripping. You saw some of the trailers were gone. They take the aluminum off and sell it for drug money. But this one, uh, they were making crystal meth out of it, I presume, and they threw it away, so I mean, for this. Yeah, you know. Is it like a lake or a sea? It's a lake, it's an inland body of a lake, but it's, it's very big. It, uh, it's about 50 miles by 14, um, I don't know how many kilometers. It's very large, it takes five hours to drive around it. If you're just driving. It's sweet water. It's salt. Salt. Which is the, that's the salt and sea. You saw we had a crystals forming towards the end. And that's what's going to kill the sea eventually, and the fish, and then the birds will stop coming, and it will be a dead sea fairly rapidly, they are guessing, unless somebody does something and nobody is doing anything but making plans. Um, good. Would you mind talking a little bit about that, that set that you were using, maybe the control scheme? I, I have a bit of a practical question, but... I was thinking, hey, this is kind of like a kind of box. Yeah, this is, a, this is the, uh, the old Bible synthesizer that Michel Weisbeach used to play. Um, and when I, uh, I met him uh, about 30 years ago, I'm getting old. <laughs> but anyway, um, and... Um, 
we met and we did a few projects together and then he said, well, take one of these and play it. Okay, so I took it and I actually ended up playing it in, in rock bands and new wave bands and what whatnot. Um, it was a very different uh, use for me than what he used it for. So we've always kept in contact and everything and um, you know, eventually Michelle sadly passed away and we, I had this idea that, that this, this thing is so amazing to me, you know? It has to be, it has to be played. <laughs> it cannot just sit there. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with it, but um, I'm not tech technically, um, I don't know anything about oscillators or whatever, but I do know it, it has a wonderful system. Uh, this works much like the little crackle box. Uh, it's a little bit more elaborate, and it has a lot to do with um, how wet my hands are, uh, do I sweat, uh, temperature-wise. Um, if I clean up a little bit more, uh, it tends to respond differently, and then um, it just it's unpredictable. So really, you cannot, I cannot say I'm gonna. Well, I can play that intro line, you know, but I don't do much else. But once I hit my hand here, then anything can happen, you know. And I love that, you know. It's just so unpredictable, you know. It, it's just um, so. <laughs> I think there's only like two. I put it on my dress. Three in existence. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, we said I'm pregnant. Oh, it's a Tony Mendo. Was it? So what? I thought this was connected to the same. No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. 